Hi, everyone. Welcome to the SAEM Research Learning Series course online lecture titled Pediatric Procedural Sedation in the Emergency Department. As we begin today, please write down and save any questions you may have for the end of the presentation. Uh, you can enter them in the chat box or unmute yourself during the Q&A portion. This presentation is being recorded and will be available shortly following today's session. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. Corey Chumpitazi. Dr. Chumpitazi is an associate professor of pediatrics, board certified in pediatrics and pediatric emergency medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. She is associate chief of research at Texas Children's Hospital with a passion for pediatric pain management and procedural sedation research education and quality improvement. She serves as sedation oversight committee chair and pain care process team assessment co-lead at Texas Children's Hospital. She is a site principal investigator for the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network for several pain related clinical trials where she serves on the PCARN pain and sedation subcommittee. She is part of the executive core and a site PI for the Emergency Medical Services for Children Innovation and Improvement Center with focus on knowledge management and research. She is co-chair of the National EMSC Scholar Development Program and serves on the executive board of the AAP Section of Emergency Medicine Women in PEM Subcommittee. She has written several pain and sedation textbook chapters, evidence-based guidelines, and research articles. Dr. Chumbitasi, I will now turn it over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mr. Landry. I am very excited to talk to you this morning on one of my favorite topics. I do not have any financial relationships to disclose, um, but I will be representing the unlabeled or unapproved uses of these drugs in children. Both set, the objectives for today's talk are to describe the importance of the delivery of high quality evidence-based sedation um, with the lens of the current guidelines, to discuss current trends and options for intranasal medicines in your research, and then to identify strategies for these new modalities through a quality improvement lens. So when I think about um, sedation practices in my ED, and it might not be different than yours, it's a master coordination like forming a pyramid. You're trying to manage all of the other responsibilities, competing responsibilities in the ED, um, trauma activations and calls, uh, making sure that the nurse has the appropriate time to, to document and monitor, that the um, orthopedic supplies or C-arm are ready to go or whatever it might be, um, and that you're ready to sedate a patient without risk factors, um, such as active upper respiratory infections, apneas, um, and that the medications are available, no drug shortages, um, and that, um, and that ev everything is ready to go. And that can be quite challenging. And so as we look through today, we really wanna try to think about how can we maximize pain and anxiety management, especially in children where we know that um, unplanned ED visits um, occur in, in all of our patients, but especially children with pain being a, a reason for seeking medical care in about 80% of our patients, and that children receive less um, pain medication than their adult counterparts, and that they're not the sickest patients in your department. And so how can we better manage anxiety and pain through a research lens and, and look at trying to improve these practices. It's no longer appropriate just to hold the children down with the routine brute force, um, but we have lots of tools in the toolbox. Um, and if you're not using some of those in the ED, then this is an opportunity to think about what you might be able to use so that we can really improve patient care and, and drive that experience. We know that pain management is a, is a large trigger for um, satisfaction scores and press gaining. And so there's a lot of reasons to manage um, patient uh, pain and anxiety management that we can chat about. 
So sedation outside the OR has rapidly expanded and you know that it makes up a big uh, proportion of your ED practice as well. We know that pediatric sedation overall outside the um, operating room accounts for over 250,000 sedations across the country and that's large, probably a, a large um, underestimate. And that a third of cases every day are outside the OR. So your ED in the radiology departments um, and outpatient clinics. So the elephant in the room in regards to sedation and sedation research, I really feel like is the rapid, um, or is the wide disparities of the sedation guidelines. And so there's not a set overarching regulatory um, guideline used by hospitals, um, even as far as credentialing. Um, and so there's a lot of variability. And so the sedation practices and the places you've trained may be vastly different from those that you will go to work in. So when we look at, at the evidence for the guidelines over the last um, 30 years, we see that initially the section of anesthesiology largely governed the, the sedation practice guidelines. And they, this was the guideline for elective use of conscious sedation. And I'd really like to get us thinking about avoiding that word conscious. Um, conscious um, means uh, awake and responsive to the surroundings according to Webster's. And that's really not the goal for the patient that you're using medications in, in your ED. Um, and then um, ASAP came out with a policy on pediatric analgesia and sedation that was greatly helpful. This was the 1994 statement um, and then has been subsequently updated. And then the um, you know, different guidelines for looking at um, radiology imaging that um, ED providers may help out with um, and other things. And so that practice has largely been transformed by a lot of, um, a lot of technology. So, faster CT scanners, lights, colors, um, devices, interactive devices have, have um, largely alleviated the need for sedation for several of those procedures in children um, in regards to radiology, but we know that there's many procedures that we still utilize um, medications for. And then ASAP came out with the clinical practice guidelines published in, in um, annals looking at classifying ketamine as a dissociative agent. And so that may be another discrepancy um, depending on where you practice if your department and hospital lists ketamine as a separate dissociative agent. So the American Academy of Pediatrics in regards to pediatric sedation specifically came up with an updated 2016 guideline. And overall, this was a, a great um, movement forward in thinking about sedation outside the OR, although still largely written by um, authored by an anesthesiologist and a dentist. Um, there was great section support um, throughout um, the different subspecialties that practice sedation. Similarly, um, the American College of Emergency Physicians convened a, a working group of many organizations involved in, um, in procedural sedation and came up with an unscheduled procedural sedation guideline. So many of our um, patients don't have the luxury of scheduling their sedation procedures in the ED. And so how can we think about um, what ramifications specifically are unique to our practice setting? And this guideline is, is a great document to help think through some of those items. Specifically, um, they, um, mentioned that they cite the Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid Services acknowledging the special situation and training of emergency medicine and that it's a unique um, environment and that patients require emergent and urgent procedures to prevent further morbidity and mortality and that the um, EM tr physicians are, are specifically trained with skill sets to manage the airway and ventilation to provide the patient rescue and that these um, emergency physicians are uniquely qualified to provide all levels of analgesia and sedation. So it's part of our practice. It should be standard of care, but it also is, um, you know, put in the set setting of your hospital oversight committee, sedation oversight committee. So this is really my um, ploy to really um, implore you to get involved with your sedation oversight committee if you're interested in sedation research. Um, it's really an opportunity to help drive the policies across your ED and, and throughout the institution. And so this is just an example of how our oversight committee 
um, as stated, as Mr. Landry mentioned, I'm um, the Sedation Oversight Committee Chair. So even though we have 86 board certified pediatric anesthesiologists, um, more, more than most countries, um, I'm the chair of the Sedation Oversight Committee. And so it does fall as un under the Medical Staff Committee and then our Sedation Oversight Committee with a close, really close relationship working with our Department of Anesthesiology, Perioperative and Pain Medicine. Um, but then our oversight really expands to all those other um, units. So ECHO, hematology, oncology clinic, um, uh, the um, different areas that sedation is provided. So get involved with your sedation oversight committee um, and see what kind of other options are, are going on throughout your institution for sedation research, um, as this can yield great collaborations um, and, and further network research in this area. In a study we um, published early 2020 in pediatrics, we looked at uh, sedations provided through the Pediatric Sedation Research Consortium. So that's a group of 44 institutions representing a mix of freestanding children's hospitals and community-based hospitals. And this data is prospectively collected and validated. Um, and uh, my hospital, Texas Children's, is one of the participating institutions. Um, and so, Overall, we have data for over 400,000 um, sedations and quality reports are provided back to the sedation institutions. So if um, there's an interest to get in, involved with network sedation research, this is one of the options. Um, when we looked at care transformation and sedation over the last um, you know, couple of decades, we saw that comparatively where that bottom blue bar is critical care docs, still across the country make up a large degree of the post folks um, submitting and, and providing pediatric sedation. Um, but we did see a growing subset of um, uh, a consistent subset of the EM phys physicians reporting. And then that orange one is, is anesthesia outside the operating room as well. Um, some of the trends we did notice is, is the hospitalist group um, is, is a growing group of, of patients providing, of um, uh, physicians providing um, sedation. And so also thinking about where um, other opportunities in your hospital might lie for other outpatient um, sedation procedures and, and expanding that practice, that scope of practice. When we look at where um, those sedations are performed, Clearly, this is an emergency medicine talk, and, and the ERs um, and uh, ED is a large um, um, place of, of sedation utilization, as well as then the radiology or sedation units make up the large subset in this database. Um, if you're interested in, in looking at this from a research standpoint, as far as procedures performed through um, it, in this, um, we see largely um, oncology. Um, procedures are, are make up um, a large percentage as well as the um, um, radiology, MRI, um, more so than CT, and then also um, the um, musculoskeletal um, bone fractures um, um, from an ED standpoint, we know um, makes up a big proportion of our ED providers. Um, so if we look at specifically what, what gets sedation in, in um, maybe your ED or for sure my ED. Um, fracture reduction was the, is the largest um, percentage of, of sedated procedures followed by incision and drainage of, of abscesses, laceration repair, um, and then other procedures. And we do very, very few um, um, sedations for imaging procedures. Um, once again, back to that pediatric study through the, the, the database, what medications are we using? Um, not surprisingly, propofol here in the green is a large um, med medication choice across the um, research consortium, um, keeping in mind that that's not going to do anything for analgesia. And so a lot of the things we do in the ER is painful. And so needing to combine um, that propofol with something else or using other modalities. Um, and then these were the other drugs seen. Thankfully, um, chlorohydrate we see largely going away um, with other medication choices. And then dexmedetomidine has been rising. So Presidex, um, as the trade name, is, um, is largely um, increasing. So great opportunities for further research for different procedures by um, medications type. Um, when we looked, um, surveyed the Pediatric Emergency Medicine North American Chiefs, we saw that the um, medications provided by these, um, by the reflective EDs across the US and Canada um, uh, was um, as shown. So 
um, ketamine and midazolam and fentanyl were utilized by almost every uh, by every ED. Um, Atomidate is still widely utilized in 84% of those EDs. Propofol, um, about um, three quarters. And then um, dexmedidomidine compared to a few years earlier is, is coming up as well, 60% use. And then 60% of EDs are using nitrous oxide. So that's another great option that we're gonna spend some time talking about here in a bit. Um, the majority who use nitrous oxide um, use it as a mobile machine as opposed to a piped in modality. Um, and then um, when we looked at these pediatric emergency medicine chiefs, they so we saw that 50% of them still classify um, ketamine as a dissociative class, which um, you know in the adult um, literature, maybe your institution is as much um, classifies ketamine as a dissociative separate class um, than lumping it in with moderate or deep sedation. Um, and then thankfully we saw that there was great end tidal use, um, which is a great adjunct following those end tidal carbon dioxide tracings um, that can really guide um, um, uh, earlier action in pediatric patients as well as adults. Um, and then a third of the departments still were sedating for radiology procedures. So how do we get to that? aha uh -huh state, um, and then how does that continuum really work when we're trying to think about what tools we might use from our research standpoint to um, um, identify the sedation state um, um, scale and, and how, what metrics should we use to try to guide this. So sedation is a continuum um, and thinking really carefully about what outcome measures you're looking at for your research studies is going to be key. Um, so the, this is but from the American Society of Anesthesiologists Committee on Quality Management um, uh, that does the ASA um, classifications from minimal sedation to moderate to deep to general anesthesia. And once again, it's a it's a um, not hard stops at those lines. It's a, it's a continuum, and so the providers the e EM physicians need to be. Um, ready to rescue at a level deeper than the sedation they're providing. Most of the time that may need um, chin lift draw thrust, um, sometimes oral or nasal adjuncts, um, but often um, um, those interventions um, don't lead to um, intubation in the vast, vast, vast majority of um, classes and cases. And so that as well as why having anesthesia time um, in the OR really doesn't make a lot of sense as far as how you're credentialing for your sedation practice. Um, so thinking about this continuum and then thinking about we as we move from maintainable airway and vitals um, to, to not maintainable. So as far as pres preservation of airway reflexes, spontaneous ventilation and CV function, as we get to general anesthesia, um, those um, at times are not um, as maintainable. And then keeping in mind that reflex withdrawal to a painful stimulus is not a purposeful response. So when we think about how we define moderate sedation and how we're targeting that based on um, um, how you're practicing in your emergency department, that may um, be needed to keep, keep in mind. So this is an example of a sedation guideline from our institution that's that's freely available online and there's many others you can find and on various resources. Um, but for we, while I completely agree that a specific drug at a specific dose in a specific child does not equal a sedation depth, um, and I really do think evidence-based guidelines should be based on a targeted depth, we're not able to um, um, cover an institution of, of, of my size across the hospital without listing doses um, into specific categories. So um, that was um, a nature um, of, of something that we had to do at our institution to um, uh, be able to, from a quality standpoint, oversee um, practices. But, um, uh, and so you'll see moderate sedation, deep sedation categories on our guideline, um, but that may, um, you know, may, is, is likely, um, like I said, even on a given day, if, if a child forgets its lovey, it didn't have a snap, um, you know, it's, it's a different, different case, different person to sedate. So what kind of things have been transforming our sedation practice and what are great opportunities for research? Um, in order to get at these, I really wanna to try to talk through a couple of cases. So feel free to write those questions in the chat and we can have a rich discussion at the end. Um, but jumping on the bed, so we know deformed forearm fractures is a large, um, a, a large common um, uh, procedure that requires sedation in your institutions. 
Um, and so what are you gonna do about this one? What kind of depth of sedation are you aiming to target? Um, and then what, what, what other things do you wanna think about? What, um, what kind of pharmacologic, what kind of non-pharmacologic? When we're thinking about our approach to children, we've got to take into all of those, all of those things into account. And we've really got to think about our, our language and expectations. So um, this is uh, Calvin and Hobbes um, uh, with looking at um, how um, the language we use. So trying to think about what expectations um, are and then how you use language so that you don't um, scare off um, the patient. So what kind of um, non-pharmacologic techniques can we use? We can use our dialogue. If you have child life specialists available um, in your ED um, to help um, with preparation for the procedure, with distraction um, during the procedure, with um, IV placement, if that's needed for your route of sedation, um, trying to think about providing that calm, non-threatening environment, um, letting the parents be present if they can, and, and they're soothing and, and not um, making the child more anxious. And then the, the distraction techniques, smartphones are great, um, um, especially with, um, and music have been really great um, adjuncts that um, the child may use regularly for other areas of, of self-calming. And so this can be a great um, option as well as guided imagery and really taking that child on a focused um, uh, preparation path for the procedure. So if we decide that we need to go ahead and end sedate, um, I think we need to definitely think about how our room's set up. Um, I always, every, every time, um, really need to get pre prepared for, for that procedure and make sure that it's set up every time the same way. And so this is a great opportunity for research well as well um, is the use of checklists and how, um, how do you do your timeouts and, and your checklist prep? Um, is, is this done consistently at your institution? Um, and, and is it documented and, and um, done so appropriately? So we can take a look at this and there's a lot of things that are, are not ready, including the patient who just went to the bathroom and tried to make a run for the exit because they knew you were coming with that, that IV. Um, so um, there's a couple of different ways to prepare. There's a couple of different checklists that have been published from a research standpoint. If those are options to try to re, um, integrate into your practice, um, those are great. Um, but thinking about your monitors, your airway equipment, your IV in place if necessary, your drug and backup plans. Um, many patients use it, many um, physicians using ketamine don't um, don't have succinylcholine at the, the bedside. A couple of years ago, it was on back order as well. Um, but thinking about what are you going to do if that patient has the laryngospasm event? How long is it going to take to get that medication? Um, is that the same time it would take you to get in um, radiology if you were sedating um, in radiology? Um, and then thinking about the suction catheters um, and the appropriate sizes for those. Um, so do you know um, where all those items are? Um, as far as patient assessment, we do know that um, upper airway and um, upper airway infection does increase risk. So while many children, after putting that IV in, will have the runny nose um, and, and crying, you know, if they truly did have a cold um, or a recent upper upper um, respiratory infection, or then if they um, parent to find that as a current upper respiratory infection with clear secretions or sick secretions, we did find some statistically significant differences in those patients um, as far as then their adverse events. So um, more chance with those thick secretions for wheezing, um, for secretions requiring suctioning here in these green boxes, um, for risk of desaturation, potential airway obstruction, the laryngospasm, um, and other things. So with those adjusted odd ratios, just being careful to really think about what is that pre-sedation um, pre risk score and are you appropriately screening that patient to be done in your emergency department or is it somebody that may require transfer um, to a tertiary quaternary care or to anesthesia? Um, and then from a patient assessment standpoint too, what kind of um, interventions were needed? So did they need suctioning? Did they need a neural airway or a nasal pharyngeal airway um, with those, those bright green being those um, thick secretion definitions as defined by the parents um, were those um, significant. And so once again, this is from that pediatric sedation research um, consortium data um, looking longitudinally over several years, prospectively collected and um, entered. 
And then looking at adverse events and sedation across sites. Um, so this study was done um, by Dr. Malabat out of um, looking across the Canadian networks. Um, and she found the um, severe serious adverse events as listed here um, as uh, at about that 1% um, rate for all serious adverse events. Um, when we look at apnea being that largest one at 0.9 um, and then the rare um, serious ad adverse events. And luckily they did have no permanent neurological injury or death. Um, and then for those other um, uh, adverse events, overall oxygen desaturation um, um, potential is, is, is in about 5.6% range, 5% um, again for vomiting, which those ranges have uh, um, varied based on the research studies. Um, and so once again, this is for um, 6,295 sedations across those six TDs across Canada. Um, and over um, half of those did receive ketamine alone. Um, and then um, another uh, 1,300 of those with either midazolam or propofol. And so um, looking at those rates as far as what you can discuss with the patients and families when they're undergoing sedation. Um, and then um, thinking about um, ketamine specifically, you can think about um, does anticholinergics increase the odds of um, adverse events? So um, if um, secretions in upper respiratory infections may put you at higher risk, then would you um, did, did anticholinergics? Um, and so um, this retrospective or this, this study out of the um, consortium as well, um, it showed that um, that risk of adverse events or serious adverse events, um, once again, um, uh, increased uh, were, were um, seen in patients who had received anticholinergics. Um, uh, and then in patients that did have a dose greater than five megs per kg ketamine. So we know that in those higher um, doses that um, uh, ketamine does um, have increased a uh, dose effect with uh, adverse events. So pre preparation, and so really letting, um, we know that preparation is key, um, providing pain control adequately prior to imaging if needed um, for a forearm fracture, um, and then providing the patient if it's gonna be a mask to get them used to the mask. Um, if it's um, using end tidal nasal cannula, as you can see in war worn by this um, child, she's got the, um, co comes into her nose and then it's got the trap to catch her um, exhale carbon dioxide from her mouth. Um, sometimes it's fun to have them play big games to see if they can, how long they can let that tracing go without um, a breath um, and thinking about how to incorporate that preparation. Um, and this is an area um, um, there can be um, research if, if you are um, interested in trying to think about how you prepare the children for sedations and, and how that affects the amount, total amount of meds given. There's lots of opportunities for um, integrated research in this area of sedation as well. So moving on to a laceration case, I know this might make up a, a large percent of your procedures and your EDs as well. Um, this is a five-year-old male who was playing on the playground and had that sustained that laceration above his eyebrow um, with um, some good pulling and, and um, a need for better cosmesis. So want to think about what kind of things can we do for them as well to add, add um, to augment their sedation experience and try to maximize that experience. And so we can think about um, topical medication. So here, um, the child life specialist is doing distraction, but could have been the same with his own iPad or, or mom's cell phone. Um, and then putting good topical anesthetic on there. And if it's sensitive to the needle test, putting a second dose on um, and holding it right before, injecting slowly with a, a um, small gauge needle, um, all those types of things to really um, get the kind of experience like, um, um, like he has here where he's um, smiling and, and um, even with that, that suture in the skin um, that um, uh, he's, he's having a good experience and, and not needing additional things. What um, additionally can help get him to this spot are several of our um, uh, minimal sedation age adjuncts. Um, and in this case, this child did receive um, internasal um, midazolam. So the nose is a, a great route um, for these medications um, and may be widely utilized at your institution. Um, but we know that the um, over the past decade, there's been a huge um, move towards this, that they have many advantages, especially in children where they don't need the intravenous line placed. Um, it has bi high bioavailability in the nose with the vascular environment. And so that it um, bypasses first pass metabolism. And that um, with that nose brain pathway, they get the effects really 
um, really on quite quickly. Um, and so I think this is um, a great way. Um, we know that um, uh, studies with um, reversible agents as well have been, been utilized intranasally as we've seen with flumazenil and, and naloxone and that that time to onset is really much quicker um, than the IV components as well. So here once again um, is uh, an example with a mucosal atomizer device to be able to spread out and really spray in that dose. Um, dose finding studies have found that uh, if you're giving really more than a milliliter, NH knows that, that they're swallowing the majority of that medication and that's less effective. So we've um, looked to kind of using that as a max um, dose. And then as far as um, the agents from a midazolam standpoint, um, typically that 0.5 to 0.4 to 0.5 um, with um, max dose 10 milligrams here, just because that most um, places carry that 10 milligrams per one ml. So that's gonna hit your max um, um, dose. And then thinking about that timing, if you're looking at the intervention for that laceration repair, um, really gotta give that internasal medicine and then just not open your kit and, um, you know, do your beta dime prep and, and start start sewing, but you've really got to give it that five to 10 minutes to kick in. Um, and then keeping in mind that that duration is going to be 45 to 60 minutes. Um, and so using it with that, that atomizer. Um, and then um, remembering that while midazolam does a lot of things from an axiolysis and amnestic standpoint, it does nothing for your analgesia. So still using your good um, topical medication and it does burn um, when it's given intranasally. So um, some folks do buffer it without epinephrine. Um, and then keeping in mind as with midazolam um, in other routes, it can um, have a paradoxical reaction, in which case they um, became become more agitated, and then it can um, be ca cause some respiratory depression, especially if it's been given with um, other medications, narcotics, um, and those kind of things. But it does have that re reversal agent with flumazenil, so um, great um, option. Um, that, like we said, is what our patient here did have. Um, but keeping in mind that we said that about a sixty minute of him still being um, a little bit. Um, having a one margarita effect. Um, and so he came home, tried to spray his siblings who were in the pool um, and walked straight into a pole because he was still <laughs> um, um, not as coordinated. So what are we gonna do about this guy um, um, with a big um, gap down to the um, galia? Um, uh, you know, we can talk about those options of, of what to do here for this guy. Um, we did decide to go with um, tissue adhesive um, and unfortunately did have more tears um, with the tissue adhesive than we had with the laceration repair because it does cause a warming um, effect that can be pretty uncomfortable um, if, if they're not knowing what to expect. So even in the case of uh, things like um, tissue adhesive, thinking about that. So um, what are our takeaways as far as options um, is I was thinking about opportunity, other opportunities for research. How do we do our discharge cr criteria? How do we even do um, our talk with um, patients and families, especially of different race and ethnicities, of how do we offer them the options? Do we give them a really good description of um, what um, the, the sedation procedure might look like? What are the responsibilities for the pa patients and parents? And then how do we um, provide that discharge um, um, education. So these are all really great opportunities for different avenues for research within sedation. Um, but overall, from a um, regulatory standpoint, you want your patient to return to baseline, um, to have those, those pre-procedure baseline vitals, monitor levels of consciousness, sedation scoring, um, and then that they can um, tolerate fluids in the absence of nausea and vomiting is, is, um, is an indication for um, some places, although um, um, some many EDs would argue that um, um, you don't want to push them on this and that they're fine to discharge without it. It, it um, is one of those areas of, of debate. Um, and then you want to give them options for adequate pain control following. Um, and so thinking about all of those things, um, there's another um, uh, hotter uh, internasal medication that's been been on the on the horizon that may or may not be used utilized at your institution, um, but dexmedetomidine. It's a sedative and a hypnotic. Um, it has really minimal effects on respiration, um, and it decreases the requirements of other medication. Um, so 
dosing. Um, some um, folks sometimes start low with the dosing at a two mic per kilo range. Um, and that I think does does a little bit of a disservice if you um, get to that three to four mix per keg. And um, Desi Neville out of um, Pittsburgh had, had a good um, first ED study um, in uh, Journal of Emergency Medicine looking at, uh, at that. Um, it does take a good 30 to 40 minutes. So if you wash out the wound on the um, for facial lacerations, um, put that lead on, give that intranasal dex, um, and let the children alone for a good 30 minutes, um, then that's really kind of the best way to work with that medication. Um, it can cause um, sinus arrhythmias um, and, um, and the IV form much more so to cause bradyarrhythmias um, and some hemodynamic fluctuations that are, are um, a lot less, less seen um, in the intranasal route, but um, um, still possible, so still trying to think about that. And then the other intranasal medicine to consider would be ketamine. Um, really do need a three to 10 mi milligram per kilogram dose. Um, and so since we're at a one milliliter um, administration volume in the nose, um, the total max dose is often limited by that, but it does um, has been reported to have an onset within five to 10 minutes and can last up to 60 minutes. Um, and so there have been um, some interest looking at intranasal ketamine as well as research opportunities. So um, in summary, here are the quick um, intranasals um, uh, at um, uh, dosing recommendations um, that um, we found to work quite well. Um, and then really still thinking about using um, your good topical anesthetics, um, distraction, child life if available, and those types of, of things as well. Um, and that, that intranasal ketamine really for the doses you're able to get to is more of an analgesia dose than sedation um, in many kids, but still an opportunity for further um, research and refinement. So what else? We already mentioned one of them, um, nitrous oxide. This has been a really great help um, for us having the portable machine. Um, it helps with axiolysis, both sedation and a, a mild analgesia as well. It's rapid onset, rapid off, and they can um, walk out the door. We've seen it and from a pre-hospital setting as well. Um, our EMS agency to the north has it on their um, trucks. And so that's been really great for pain control as well. So it can be in, administered in a 30% to 70% concentration with oxygen. Um, and there's a couple different de device types. Um, the flow where you, you get that that, that flow to, um, regardless of if they're able to trigger the device. Um, and then the divan valve um, devices that um, do need a, a little bit um, a bigger child to be able to trigger that divan device. Um, and then most of the commercially available units do have a combined delivery and scavenger system. So um, it has been used effectively in combination for more painful procedures. So if you can get it with a um, another stronger anal analgesic, um, then it can be quite effective for those more moderate um, or severe procedures as well. Um, and lots of really great um, resources from the Zyre group um, uh, out of Minnesota um, and several others published on this area, but a really great opportunity. Um, it also vasodilates, which is fantastic um, from our um, um, from our standpoint in, in our difficult access patients. Um, and it's been popular in dental clinics for decades. So um, lots and lots of years of, of really good use. Disadvantage sometimes can be labor intensive to set up. Um, there is a high nausea and vomiting rate, um, although they don't remember it. So um, I had had a patient that um, was like, I don't want to vomit, I don't want to vomit, I don't want to vomit. Um, she did vomit, um, was able to control her airway and her reflexes and everything, uh, and then was able to sedate and finish the procedure. And she woke up and she said, you know, I was so glad you did a vomit. And she had you know, stuff everywhere. So um, the good part about that would be the amnestic aspect. Um, it does require that mask position and good hold. And so um, in um, younger patients that can't kind of get comfortable with that. And then of course there is the nasal hoods that the dentists um, use as well that are an option. Um, and then it can be a, a, an additional cost. Um, and we've got to think about those scavenging systems. So lots of options for research within nitrous oxide and comparing it to other medications. Um, uh, there are um, nurse administered protocols, so um, our nurses are able to administer it at 50% or less um, for IV starts, difficult access, minor procedures, um, and so that's been very helpful as well, um, but it's an area that's ripe for research. 
In addition, I think um, sedation is the perfect um, area to, to simulate. We know that our high risk um, uh, with high morbidity, mortality happen in a very infrequently. And so um, in order to provide for these kind of things and some of the a little bit more common serious adverse events such as laryngospasm, simulation is an incredible opportunity um, to do this. So um, some of the areas that would be great to think about is, is thinking about um, preparing regardless of medication chosen um, is upper airway obstruction, apnea, laryngospasm, and then what kind of interventions might you need to do skills teaching on as well. Um, thinking about air, can, air airway repositioning with the chin lift and jaw thrust, um, um, you know, making sure that the sectioning set up, um, how to big valve mask in the little children, um, and then the placement of airway adjuncts. So all great opportunities for, for thinking about um, based on the adverse events that we've seen um, as published in some of the other studies. There's several courses offered across the country um, um, from the different societies um, as well. And so there are opportunities to do different um, sedation education pathways and try to get more experience in areas that um, if you haven't, um, have a gap, um, and then opportunities to teach and to learn in these areas as well. And so, like we said, a lot goes into this purposely, perfectly coordinated sedation. Um, and, and in order to get there, thinking about what are your tools in your toolbox, how might we be use, able to use those from a research standpoint, either head to head, um, as far as how we can maximize our sedation um, safety from a, a checklist standpoint, there's great opportunities. Same thing from a simulation, from, from a, how, um, and then how to simulate new areas. So if you are, your um, scanner's under construction and you're gonna have to take the patient um, outside, you know, further, you know, might we wanna simulate that and opportunities um, to learn about the different environments. Um, so just so many opportunities within sedation from a research standpoint um, and really a lot of great opportunities um, for networks across the country to get involved with, to really try to think about um, that. Um, I'd encourage you to join the PEM listserv. Um, um, so if, if you Google um, the PEM fellows listserv, um, Pediatric Emergency Medicine PEM, um, that's a great opportunity where um, the um, submissions are, are archived and there's great opportunities for to think about some of these um, research studies as they relate to children. Um, and then just lots of other options. So in summary, um, think about that pre-sedation assessment. Is it, is it an opportunity for quality improvement in your setup? Uh, um, I was thinking about that setup is super important when we think about our, our sedation um, research from an, uh, building your armatarium. If there's medications you're not using, how might you get more experience with that? It might be a good um, um, opportunity in your setting. Um, we didn't really touch on MPO guidelines, um, but that's another great opportunity for, for research. Um, here um, at Texas Children's, you'll see on our guideline, we do not have an NPO time for um, moderate sedation in the ED um, due to our review of the um, evidence and, and the research. Um, and so thinking about um, how you might in integrate that into your practice. Um, and then just thorough selection of the knowledge um, in the pharmacokinetics um, can offer a, a great opportunity for trying to look at, at um, these studies head to head. And then also so that we can learn more about satisfaction because um, I think um, patient and parental satisfaction and integration into our practice is really important. And so there's lots of opportunities for research in this um, and use the guidelines and then help to be a, um, a source of uh, positive change in your settings um, if there's areas that, that need improvement or you see opportunities. So um, my last point is please don't use conscious sedation. It um, doesn't help any of us out in talking to patients and families, but otherwise I uh, will call it procedural sedation. And I'd like to thank you for your time today and for, for um, watching and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions, um, emailing me at the address listed here or um, find me on Twitter. Um, and I thank you for your time. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Dr. Chumpatazi, for this very informative presentation. And thank you to everyone watching this presentation for the SAM Research Learning Series on Pediatric Procedural Sedation in the Emergency Department. Mm -hmm. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.